Three months have passed since the newly found mutants have been brought together, being trained by the last survivors and both Logan and the professor respectively. They saw to it that the children were able to hone their skills to gain better control and mastery over them. Each one excelled and had strengths and weaknesses in various aspects when it came to their powers and abilities. There were some that were more adept at using them. They almost came second nature, while there were others who were still struggling to come to grips with what they had become. It was one evening in particular, the students who had been together had finished having dinner when they were all relaxing in one of the main hall rooms. Thankfully, the mansion that was brought had plenty of place to sleep and to congregate amongst each other. Some were cuddled up with their significant others respectively, while others were sitting in various groups talking amongst themselves. They were simply coming to grips with what had happened to them, and there were some that were wondering what was next, Junichi being one of them. All right, guys, serious question now. Junichi got everyone's attention. The boy with angel light wings standing in the middle of the group as he spoke. So we've been at this for around three months or so. And don't get me wrong, for all the ups and downs, I've really come to like hanging out with a lot of you guys. But what exactly happens next? What are you getting at? Jiro would ask. Look, all I'm saying is, we've got these powers, maybe we should use them. No, Misaki would say. No, that's, that's a horrible idea. We were never meant to have these powers in the first place. We shouldn't just go around trying to be something that we aren't. But what are we exactly, Sakuta would say. It's obvious that we're not what we used to be. And who knows when or if we'll ever get a chance to be normal again. Look, I will say that this isn't the first time something strange has happened to me in my life. And while normally it ends up working itself out, I don't know about this this time around. So what exactly are we supposed to do? Do we just stay like this forever? Akari would then speak up and ask the group as well. There was a growing concern amongst the teens. How long exactly were they supposed to have these powers? Were they ever going to change? Would they ever be back to normal? Because for the last three months, they had been training nonstop. All of that just to make sure that they had an understanding of what they could do. To make sure that they didn't end up accidentally harming anyone. That was the most important thing. That was the main thing that was drilled into their head. One false step in public and things could go haywire. So far, as much as they were able to tell, things were kept under wraps. The incident that had occurred and gave them these fantastical powers was so far just being chalked up to some natural phenomena, disaster, or whatnot. While some scientists were studying into it, there was no correlation to mutants or anything like that. The professor had a few contacts within public office and various forms of government all around the world. And from what they were able to gather, no one was putting the correlation between mutants and this incident together. But for now, they just wanted to make sure that everything stayed under the radar. The last thing they needed was any news of this coming to light. If the world found out that mutants were now starting to be reborn and cropped back up, it could lead to a whole other disaster. Because now, no one would know. They'd be stuck in the dark once again trying to figure out who's a mutant and who's not. And there were many people in the world who'd be all too eager to jump on that chaos and use it for their own gains. So for now, keeping the teens secret was parative among everything else. But they were starting to get a little cramped. Things were starting to get a little bit testy. How long could they stay here? How long were they supposed to stay here? This so-called school for the gifted, you could use with air quotes.
I don't know. I mean, it doesn't seem all that bad, Tomo and June would say respectively. It's actually been a lot of fun. I enjoy getting a chance to spar with all of you. Yeah, some of us, not so much, Nayato would say. Aw, oh, come on, senpai, it's not so bad. Nagatoro kept disappearing and reappearing all around them. You just gotta learn to cut loose, live a little, have some fun. And you've gotten really good at your judo. You weren't terrible a couple months ago, but now look at you. You can actually hold your own, and you can fade through walls. <clears throat> Although, I have to be careful with you. You never know. Your lecherous eyes may go wandering through walls you're not meant to go through. N Nagatoro, I wouldn't do something like that. <laughs> I don't know, senpai. You have a tendency to be a little sus. I mean, between those books that you're reading and the way that you've been drawing all of these people. I mean, drawing? What drawings? Nagatoro disappeared and reappeared. She had gone to Naito's room and grabbed the sketchbook. Naito had been drawing many of the other teens around him, displaying their powers and in great detail. And with some of the girls, exquisite detail. Detail in the hips, thighs, and sometimes the chest area, to be more specific. To which Nagatoro sometimes was not a fan of. Especially with Yukana. I see you like them big and round. What? I, I was just, I, I mean, I... Junichi would just put his hands on Naito's shoulder. I don't blame you. I don't blame you. Melanchon is the way to go. I'm just sorry you got stuck with lemons. Nagatoro then disappeared and reappeared right behind him, holding something to his neck. It was a fork. I'm sorry. What did you say, angel boy? Do I need to clip your wings? What the? I, no, I did. I did. Oh, good. help me! All right, all right, guys, calm down. Mia Moore was the next to speak up. Everyone looking to him, as they often did. The boy was the most somber of everyone in the group. Of course, there were those who were taking their situation in stride, but he was doing so more than everyone else. The fact of the matter was, was he was the one that seemed to act like a leader of sorts amongst them. The one that was always rallying everyone together and getting them to fall in line when need be. It just got to a point where it felt like everyone just naturally deferred to Miyamura. It has been difficult, that's for sure. But still, in spite of everything we've gone through, we've managed to come out on the other side relatively unscathed. I'm not sure what the future holds, but as long as we keep sticking together, I'm sure we'll get through it. That's easier said than done, Misaki would say. What if we're stuck like this forever? I, I mean, what are we supposed to? No, no, no. There's no need to worry about it, my precious Misaki. Usui was quick to wrap his arms around her. Misaki had a look of fear on her face. While she was getting better at controlling her powers, she just didn't like being touched the way she used to, although she didn't really like it at all back then either. But that's the thing. So often you take the little things in life for granted. The idea of just being able to see, touch, hear, smell. All the things that you do normally, day in and day out without a second thought. But now all of a sudden, what do you do when you can't express yourself the way you want to? Forget having a kiss. Forget trying to show passion and love. Just being able to hold the hand of someone you care about. To embrace them in a hug without worry of skin-to-skin -skin contact. The fact that you might not be able to look upon someone with your own natural eyes anymore. That they become nothing more but figments of red hues. Or the idea that you walk around with what you might view as a deformity. Or you have to be careful with how much strength you try to pull someone into. Doing the daily tasks that normally seem mundane, now they become much, much more tricky. And for some, it's easier than others. 
Some people can hide it easier than others. But that was the new struggles that they were all dealing with. The struggles that they were all coming to terms with. The last thing that some of them wanted was to get involved in a line of business that was far beyond their means. Hero work? They weren't heroes. They were just ordinary kids. Teens trying to navigate their lives when all of a sudden this power was thrusted upon them that they didn't ask for. And now even more so, some mysterious bald man and a man with claws just shows up out of nowhere, takes them from their homes, sets them up in this place, and it's almost... It's almost too coincidental. That was one thing that was on my Sakurajima's mind. As everyone was talking amongst themselves about what they wanted to do and about what they should do. That was the one thing that Mai had been thinking about. All of this felt a little too coincidental. The whole storm gaining their powers. Someone offering to help. My was someone who liked to think she was a good judge of character. She liked to see what other people didn't. And when it came to the professor, for all that talk, bravado, and charm that he used, there was always something underlying about it. Like, as if there was a truth that he wasn't saying, as if he knew something, but he never gave away fully that he did. From what she had been able to gather, between him and Logan, Logan seemed on the up and up. Sure, she could be wrong, but at least from the way Logan acted, he didn't act like he wanted to be here. Yes, he accepted his role here, his job as being their mentor, but he never treated it like it was something he really wanted. It was like it was something that was thrust upon him, as if he was forced into this role. But the professor, no. He seemed to be on top of everything. Every question they had would had an answer to it. Everything that needed to be sorted out, he took care of it. And then there was his room. His room that was off limits to everyone in the mansion. A room that he left from time to time and traversed. But it was always kept under lock. A lock specially set from everything else. No one paid much attention to it, and no one really cared to go in there. But for Mai, she had her misgivings. Maybe the professor wasn't evil, but there was something to him. Something that he wasn't sharing with the rest of the group. For now, though, she kept it to herself, but she also kept her eyes on someone. And that was Hori. There was something about her. Whatever was going on, And whatever was going to come. She just had this sneaking feeling like she would play a key part in it. But for now, with all that speculating and with everything else coming to a close, they all decided to turn in for the night. Some were going off to talk with some other people. And before long, everyone went to their respective rooms. The girls to the west side of the mansion and the boys to the east. However, the boys, they were still all up, wide and awake. All the way up until around 11 o'clock, near midnight, when the boys were going into the kitchen. They couldn't sleep for the most part, so they decided to chill out with some ice cream. And that's when the idea got brought up once again. By June, of all people. I'm not gonna lie. Maybe we could do some good with our powers, June would say. Oh, what? Now you're on the hero train too? Jiro asked. Hey, Jiro, my ice cream's getting a little cold. You mind? Jiro just tapped the bowl and the ice cream refroze itself to a nice state as if it were fresh once again. Oh, thanks, man, Usui asked. But seriously... What if we just, I don't know, went out on patrol just to see what's on the up and up? It's not like we live in an area where there's a lot of crime, though, Sakata said. 
for the few crimes there are, I'm pretty sure the police can handle it. Yeah, but sometimes they're not fast enough. My point exactly, Junichi would say in agreement with June. I mean, come on. We've got the gifts. We've got the skills. What if there's a mugger? What if there's someone who's in danger? Someone who's lost? With our powers, we could be in and out just like that. They never even know what happened. We could stay anonymous and we could do a little good. Yeah, but how far are we trying to go, though? Usui would say. I mean, sure, helping someone from falling or saving someone from getting mugged is one thing. But what if the situation gets more complicated? We'd be going in blind not knowing what we're supposed to do. Who do we trust and who do we not trust? Come on. All we got to do is just go out for one night. It's no big deal. Besides, what's the worst that can happen? A lot. We can end up hurting people. We can end up getting caught. There's no telling what we can end up getting ourselves into. Ryuji said this to everyone, still lamenting at how he hadn't quite gotten the mastery over his own power. He was getting better, but it was obvious that Taiga was far exceeding his expectations. You know, a lot of times, when you think you're trying to do the most good, that's usually when the bad things can start. Sure, we want to help people. Maybe we think we're doing some good. But what if the situation goes south? Last time I checked, none of us have the power to bring someone back to life. If people get hurt now, it's bad, but we didn't cause it. No one can fault us. But the moment we get involved, the moment we choose to stick our neck into something that doesn't pertain to us, and then bad things happen, that falls on us and potentially our families. What are we supposed to do if they end up seeing us out there just acting like vigilantes, superheroes? Junichi would say, doesn't matter. I think we've put them through enough just to be in the situation that we're in right now. We didn't put them through anything, Naito would say. It's not our fault that we end up becoming like this. Although I do agree, I don't know if we're supposed to be getting involved in stuff like this or not. Look, let's just play it to a vote. If we can go out for just one night and just walk around and see what happens. If nothing happens at all, we can just come back and we can pretend like we just went out. That's all. But we're just going out looking for trouble, Jun Nichiro would say. That's where we could really end up screwing up things. Before long, everyone looked at Miyamura once again. Some knew what they wanted to do, others not so sure. But in the end, before they did anything, they wanted to get his opinion on it. Personally, I don't want to go out. But I can't actually stop any of you from doing what you want to do. Okay then, let's put it to a vote. What are we going to do? Everyone decided, ultimately, with more than enough votes in favor of just going out to see what happens. Of course, the boys would have to be discreet about this. They all agreed to wait, to wait until everyone was sound asleep. Logan had a keen sense of hearing and smell, so they know that they'd have to definitely be careful when it came to him. But, sure enough... By around a little after midnight, when it seemed as though everything had settled down, slowly the boys would sneak out of their window, making sure not to arouse anyone at all. Once they felt they were a good enough distance away, they would immediately set their sights on the subway station, with a railway not too far from them that would lead directly to the city. Among many of the issues with this plan, besides the fact that the boys were all underage in some way, shape, or form, 
which meant being out past a certain time of night could already be a danger in and of itself. There was also the idea of just what exactly were they expecting to find? What exactly were they trying to see? Well, they didn't really know right off the bat. Jun would hold on to his phone, all the boys would, with Junichi deciding that he was going to take to the skies. He had never really flown over the city of Tokyo before, and he wanted to get the view. He figured if he spied anything or saw anything, he just called him. With that out of the way, Junichi would take off. They watched him fly into the night sky and then loom over the city above, while the others would go in on foot. They walked in a group, the boys not trying to draw any much attention to themselves. Seeing the bright lights of the city, the people who came out during this time of night, the music, the life scene, everyone having a good time. Yeah, this was definitely the nightlife in Tokyo. Although, maybe if they got a chance, they could do a patrol like this in other areas. Maybe somewhere like Shibuya or Kyoto or Hokkaido. Although Hokkaido was kind of cold these times of year. It didn't take long to see a problem that was occurring. It came in the form of two drunk guys who were stepping out of a bar, the two of them fighting over some form of disrespect, and it was starting to cause a little bit of a ruckus. You're gonna take back what you said, you hear me, you bastard? What? You got a problem that she was looking at me instead of you? You know, I've been sick of your crap for a long time now. We come out here to have fun, but here you go. Always trying to be a buzzkill. <laughs> no wonder why Sydney left you. What was that? Oh, it's plain as day. She was screwing everyone from here to the west side of the tracks. <laughs> and you were the last one to figure it out. That seemed to take it one step too far, and the two men were engaged in a fight. The boys looked on, deciding what they should do. Should they really get involved in a dispute like this? Well, after thinking it over, Sakata decided that maybe he could intervene. Moving in quickly using his speed, he separated the two men. One guy was taken to an alleyway across town, and the other one was taken to the front of a convenience store. Thankfully, Sakuta moved fast enough that no one knew what happened, although everyone was definitely perplexed. The few who were watching the engagement happen, one second they were there, the next they were gone. Well, that seems to take care of that. Sakuta, what did you... I just dropped them off apart, about five blocks each in the opposite directions. Hopefully that'll give them enough time to cool down and get their wits about them. So the situation doesn't progress any further than it needs to. They all agree with that, and thus they would continue their walk. The night became rather mundane. It didn't really seem like there was much more that they needed to do, at least not in any meaningful degree. A couple of bar fights here and there, a couple of people getting lost, helping a couple of girls who were getting hit on by some drunk, creepy dudes. All in all, it seemed rather mundane. It seemed like the job any police officer could do. It was about to be 1.30 a.m. in the morning, and the boys decided that maybe now was time for them to turn back, when suddenly they got a call from Junichi. Hello? Miyamura would say. Junichi, what's up? Trouble, real trouble. About seven blocks from you guys. There's an apartment building. It caught fire. Caught fire. The boys would immediately begin rushing to the scene. How bad is it? It's getting really bad. We're talking about a four-story apartment. Fire took place on the second floor. It's moving down and above. There are people still trapped in there. Are there firefighters? How far are they? They're pretty backed up. I'd say it's going to take them... At least 12 minutes to get there. And by the time they do, who knows if they can hold out for much longer. Alright, we're on it. Sakuta, right? 
Without even a hesitation, Sakuta moved faster than everyone else, getting to the scene of the fire much quickly. Although, those who were able to keep up were going to be getting there not too far behind. For June, the increased speed and strength in his legs, it allowed him to move at a much faster pace. He was the first to arrive, followed by a few of the others. They could see that the building was really starting to be engulfed in flame. Miyamura would direct traffic, getting everyone in the best position. Junichi, you stay above. Let us know what's going on from the outside. Alright, Ryuji, Chiro, you guys are going to go through the back door. Ryuji, you've gotten really good at controlling flames, so everyone you find, try and dead them out as best you can. Chiro, you're going to use your ice powers to try to put out as much of the fire as possible. June, you're going to work on evacuation along with Sakuta. That way we can get everyone out as quickly as possible and as many people as possible. I'll try to cut through any debris that's too big for us with my eyes. Hopefully the laser will be able to take out any of the big rubble. Naito, you've got the ability to move through walls. Try and find any areas where someone might be trapped and we can't get to them, but you can. The flames shouldn't bother you if you're able to walk through them. Then there was Usui. Usui, you stay on the outside, you monitor everything. I don't mean to leave you in the dust, but I don't think your powers will be able to help this time around. It's no problem. I'll make sure to give anyone a slip just in case. Try to give you guys enough time. Now hurry! With that, the boys moved into action. Ryuji and Jiro would be the first to enter in through the back door of the apartment. For Ryuji, his power didn't just come in creating fire, but it also came in controlling fire. He would create pathways by taking out the flames that were coming through the halls as both Jun and Sakuta would begin the evacuation. For Sakuta, he was able to move fast enough, able to get from room to room, and he was able to get through the doors effectively enough, helping to get people out as quickly as he could. As for Jun, he carried multiple people on his back, and he had no qualms with jumping out of the window if need be, Thankfully, jumping out of even two, three, or four stories, it wasn't too difficult for the likes of him. Jiro, in the meanwhile, was creating strong gusts of ice-like wind, allowing for the flames to slowly be put out. He didn't want to try to counter by just creating ice, since the ice would just end up melting anyway, and he didn't want to give off who they truly were. Usui stood on the outside on the phone along with Junichi, keeping a monitor for anyone who was looking at what they were doing to make sure that at the very least no one got caught using their powers in an outrageous way. As they made their way to the third floor, one of the halls had become collapsed as a part of the upper floor had fallen through. Miyamura would raise his glasses, opening his eyes and using the laser beams to cut through the debris, cutting it down and opening a path for them to get through once again. All the way to the fourth floor, there were cries. It was the sounds of a young child. Naito would move on ahead, moving up the stairs once again. The halls were covered in flames, and he had every reason to be fearful. But what he worried about even more was the potential of someone else getting hurt. He took a deep breath and began to activate his powers, walking through the flames effectively, until eventually... He managed to get to the other side. Walking through the door, he managed to find the boy who was cowering in his room. The boy was scared. Because of the fact that the fire had started and he had nowhere to go, he ended up hiding in the closet. It's okay. You're going to be fine. We're going to get you out of here. The little boy, while fearful and not wanting to move, Naito would pick up a teddy bear it seemed to be something that the boy was attached to. Grabbing onto it, Naito would pick up the boy. Able to use his permutation on both him and the child, he told him to close his eyes as they quickly sped out, making it back to the hall with the others. As the evacuation would continue, the ground was starting to shake. There was a gas line that was connected to the building, 
and it was going to be set to blow pretty soon. They were still helping with the evacuations, getting people out as quickly as they could. The fire trucks were starting to arrive in the distance, and it seemed as though they had finally gotten the last of everyone out of there. Usui was getting back on call with the boys, along with Junichi, telling them that now was the time to get out of there as quickly as possible, since the firefighters were set to arrive. However, for Ryuji, he could feel something. He could feel as if there was going to be a great combustion of flames. It was going to come from the center of the building. Oh God. What's the matter, Ryuji? I can feel the flames. This place is going to go sky high. We've got to control the fire as best we can. Control it? How are we going to be able to control it? I, I think I can control it. I'll try to absorb as much of the blast as I can. You can't. That's too dangerous. Even if you manage to absorb the flames, the building's all but sure going to come down on top of you. You're not going to survive that. We don't have much of a choice. If we just allow the blast to go off, no one's going to be backed away far enough. At least this whole block is going to go up in smoke. The boys were now starting to panic. What were they going to do? If they just stayed here and did nothing, then for sure everyone was going to be engulfed. Even if they moved their fastest, they couldn't clear the area far enough to get everyone out of the way. But at the same time, they couldn't just allow someone to stay behind and get hurt. I'll be all right, I promise. He's not going to be alone, Jiro said. I'll give him as much cover as I can. Try to control as much of the flames with my ice power. Naito would also stay back giving the young child to Miyamura. I'll make sure that the debris doesn't hurt them. We'll be able to get out. Trust us. Fine. But you guys better get out of there. You hear me? All right, everyone. Let's move. The last of the few would be cleared out of the building. They would all retreat back with Usui, who had been watching from the sidelines. How'd it go? What's going to happen? The building's set to blow up. It's going to what? It seems to be a broken gas line or something. It's going to burst in flames. We need to get everyone back as far as we can. All right, then. Everyone, the building's about to blow. We need to get to a safer distance. Move now. The people were still panicked and confused. They weren't really sure about what they were supposed to do in that moment. Some people were still just standing by idly. It was like they weren't taking the hint. Some were, but some weren't. Usui just had enough. This was time for what his training was meant for. He grabbed out a deck of cards. It was a little trick that Logan had told him about, the person who used the powers before him. Grabbing a few set of cards in his hands, he flicked them towards the ground in front of the civilians, charged with energy as they started to blow up, catching everyone's attention finally as he told them all to get out of the way. In the meantime, inside of the heart of the building, Ryuji had to focus. When the explosion came, he had to absorb as much of the fire as possible. In the meantime, Jiro was trying to keep them all shielded with ice to keep them cool for what it's worth. And for Nayato... He was going to have to make sure that everyone would be intangible when the building ultimately collapsed. Otherwise, they'd end up being crushed, buried, and burnt to death. Are you sure about this? Jiro asked. No, not in the slightest. Well, if it does end like this, I gotta say, I could think of worse ways to go. Can we not think about this? Naito said. Sure, he was putting on a brave face, but still, the boy was fearful for his life. But now all that fear had to go out the window. Ryuji took a deep breath, breathing in and out. At the moment, the explosion would begin. Ryuji taking in a deep breath, using his power, absorbed as much of the flames as he could. Instead of the flames shooting outwards and into the crowds of people who had all thankfully backed up as farther as they could, 
the firefighters now having to stop in their tracks as they could feel the ground shaking from the explosion. The flames didn't reach out nearly as far as they could have. Ryuji absorbed them all into himself as he raised his hands high into the air, shooting out what appeared to be a massive explosion. As he raised both his hands together and kept them cusped, shooting it out into a focused blast of energy. It shot straight through the building, shooting high into the sky itself, like a great ball of fire. It looked as though they had watched the sun jump into the sky under the dead of night before bursting in flame, the building quickly collapsing onto itself. Everyone else just looked on, hoping, hoping beyond all doubt that they were able to make it out of that. It was too fiery and smoldery for them to get through. But amongst the smoke and the flames, there were footsteps that started to emerge. Nayato holding on to both Jiro and Ryuji, permeating their bodies as well, so that the debris, the flames, the smoke, it all just went through them. He kept it trained on them long enough until they arrived when he finally let go. <sighs> oh, we... You did it! The boys embraced into a group hug. This could have been a major catastrophe. At the bare minimum, at least 40 people could have died if they hadn't gotten there as soon as they did. Thankfully, they had managed to come out on the other side. Firefighters and police would arrive soon after. Ambulances, distributing first aid, and everything else. The boys were quick to get out of Dodge, and for many of the people, they wondered. Who were they? They didn't know anything about them. All they knew was that in their moment of need, someone came. And if they didn't know any better, they could have sworn they saw what appeared to be an angel flying in the night sky. As if God or whatever force out there had sent someone to answer their prayer in the time of need. Before long, the boys would eventually arrive back to the mansion, tired and exhausted from what they had just endured. But still, they had managed to do a really good thing. As they slowly crept through the front entrance, they all figured that they'd be able to get back to their rooms with no worry. Well, if that's what they thought, they'd be dead wrong. Because you see, there was someone sitting there in a hood. As it was slowly removed, Ryuji knew all too well who it was. It was Taiga. T Taiga, what are you? So, you boys wanted to be a little heroic tonight? Huh? What, what do you mean? I, you know... Besides breaking curfew and every other rule that Mr. Logan set out for us, I gotta say, you boys were able to whip up in the shape when you needed to. Good job out there. Have you been following us this whole time? No, you dumb dog. I haven't. I've just been sitting here waiting and I could read your minds. Wait, can you? No, I can't, but you obviously told on yourself, idiot. Oh, yeah. L look. I'm sorry, Miyamura would say. I know we probably shouldn't have gone out, and what are you apologizing for? You did a good job, you cyclops. But still, if you were going to do something like that, you could have at least called on us to help. I mean, if we had all worked together, we could have handled that situation so much better. So, here's what I'm thinking. If you guys want to go around being heroes, that's all fine and good. But I think we should get in also. We. 
From out of the shadows, the other girls walked forward also. Tyga also told them too. Don't go leaving us out like that. Jiro, you dummy! Akari would punch him in the arm. June! Tomo grabbed hold of him. How could you do something so reckless like that and not call me back there for help? Come on, just what you think you're getting at, June? I thought we were supposed to be friends, huh? I thought you were supposed to love me. If you love me, then you should let me get involved in dangerous stuff too. We're a team, damn it. Don't you get it? Oh, Tomo, I, I get it, okay? Please stop shaking me. I don't like being lied to, Senpai. Nagatoro, I, I just, I, I, I stare. I, I, I mean, I just stare. I'm, uh, okay, I'm sorry. Usui, of all of the most irresponsible, boneheaded things you could have done, you could have gotten killed. But I didn't get killed. Isn't that the best part? Oh! Oof. Misaki took off her glove and touched the back of his neck. Oh, 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 that feels good. That feels so good. Don't stop. Pervert. And I have no regrets about it. I see you're still in one piece, Mai would say to Sakata. Yeah, um, I just... Mai would simply step on his foot and pinch his cheeks. Ow, I'm in pain. You know you like it. Yeah, I do. Miyamura? Hori, I... Ow! Hori ended up slapping him in the face. You dummy. You dumb, dumb, dummy. Don't ever do something like that again, you understand me? I will make you regret it. Uh, hey, Yukana. Junichi. Um, I... No more of my baked goodies for a week. Huh? But I... You need to be punished, Junichi. Okay. <sighs> so what now? Ryuji asked Taiga. What now? I already told you. You're not going to go out and do stuff like this on your own. If you're going out, we're all going out. After all, you can't be the only X-Men going out saving the day. X-Men? So that's what we're going with? I mean, I get that the other team used X-Men, but don't we need to have a new name, though? Junichi would ask. No. I think X-Men works for us. It's what we are now. And that's what we need to be. We're the X-Men. Well, if we're going to be the X-Men, we can't go dressed like this. Ooh, 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 I got it, I got it, I got it. Leave it to me. Akari said, waving her hand in the air excitedly. I was looking around and I saw some old fabric of blue and yellow. It might be a little last minute, but I think I can totally hook us up with costumes. Oh, hell yeah! Tomo said as she raised her fist in the air excitedly. Looks like our training arc's finally over, ladies and gentlemen. Time for the hero arc to begin. Let's do this! Everyone was jumping up excitedly, happy about the prospect of what was to come. And while some had their reservations, it was like Miyamura said, they could get through anything as long as they stuck together. This concludes X-Men The Next Generation, What If Wolverine Trained the X-Men, Season 1, Part 5, the mid-season finale. Yes, I said mid-season finale because now I want to ask a little something of my audience. So far, you guys have really been enjoying this series and have really been engaged with it, which has only motivated me more and more with fleshing out this series and with so much more that's to come out now and in the future. But before we go any further, I actually do have a requirement. If you guys want this series to continue and you want there to be a conclusion to season one, that being the next five parts, then this video will have a like goal. That's right. For this like goal, you have to get this video by this Sunday to 50 likes. 
If we get the 50 likes by midnight Sunday night, then I will finish with the last five parts of season one next week. So that is your goal going forward. If you want this season one to continue, then you got to get this video to 50 likes. So for everyone who's been supporting this story so far, for everyone who's been enjoying this story so far, continue to show that support. Continue to show what you like and what you want to see. That way I can bring just as much passion and fire to these stories because I'm looking forward to it. I know you're looking forward to it. So let's get this video to 50 likes. But anyway, that's going to do it for the end of today's video. I'm Javon Harrington with Power Core Productions and Podcastings. Signing off, and I'll see you next time.